Hey, welcome everybody. This is John Paul Dutch with Dr. Speed Selling. This is Raging Verbalist number 224. Raging Verbalist for all of you who are brand new. Glad you're here. If you're an old hat, glad to have you back. Uh, we talk about a variety of different topics. We don't veer off too much into politics, but something that bugs me or is out there that I just have to comment on. We're on YouTube every Friday and Facebook, and the Facebook group is Position to Win Book, Position to Win Book, which is handily named because, of course, that's the name of my book. Now, as always, we have the ever lovely Sandra, and Sandra will be asking me the tough questions, plying me with those things that if you were in my room, you would be asking, assuming you did all the prep and everything else. But all right. Well, welcome, Sandra. Hello. How are you doing today? I am charged up because of our topic. <laughs> Buzz. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's, that's our first Easter egg, and it isn't even Easter. <laughs> So. There you go. <laughs> All right. So we are talking about the electric vehicle market. So has the EV market cooled recently? If you looked at the hype and you looked at how much advertising, how much money has been spent, how many, you know, you talk about it, you can't go anywhere without people talking about EVs. You would have thought that this thing was just blowing out the doors. It was doing all kinds of crazy things. You know, here an EV, there an EV, everywhere an EV. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they start stacking up in dealer lots. They, you know, Tesla is playing games with pricing. And well, yeah, I would say cooling is a nice way of saying it. We're not to like a, a winter yet, but uh, give it some time. All right. And were you surprised about the charging situation in Chicago? For those of you who may not remember this, uh, all of these people who had these Teslas and other EVs needed to get them charged. By the way, that is a big deal. Uh, in my experience of renting several Teslas, your life now revolves around charging. You know, nothing else matters. Your life revolves around charging. Just a point of fact. Now, some of you fanboys and girls or whatever you want to call yourselves will say, John, this is absurd. This is all that. Uh, no. No, no, because you, you know this is like having the biggest cell phone in the world. And by the way, I worry about my cell phone. I have connections everywhere. Back to Chicago. Believe it or not, and I know this is probably new, and no, this has nothing to do with this thing called climate change. It has to deal with where it's at, is that it gets cold in Chicago. I have been in Chicago, and it is bitter cold. I mean, er. And so all these people wanted to go get their Tesla charged up. So they drove it over to the Tesla supercharging network, assuming they could back their car in there because there was all the snow. And they plugged it in and the car basically wasn't taking a charge because, well, there's a thing called the cold soak factor. Cold soak means that if you put something in a cold environment, it just keeps getting colder and colder and colder. Well, that was the case. And it had a lot of uh, controversy, lots of people talking about it. So I wasn't surprised by it, considering that when I was renting a Tesla and I would say, I'm going to go charge it to return it to Hertz and I would plug it in. They already have a feature in the software that says we're going to precondition the battery. And I plugged it in and it said, well, you should have preconditioned the battery more. And I was in. 50 degree weather, not 10 degree weather. And this is all Fahrenheit. So you guys need to do the math, you know, get out your slide rule and figure out what that was. So yes, I was not surprised about it because it was only a matter of time before a lot of people who didn't have the optimum situation where you have a nice garage, it's sitting inside, you can plug it in overnight. You don't have to worry about it. When you don't have that, this is the reality of life. So that did not surprise me. And do you feel anywhere cold is an option? Well, that comes into question because you're going to end up having to have battery heaters. Now, growing up in Denver, I can tell you that my father had his you know, F pickup, F100 pickup. They didn't have 150s in those days. And he had an engine block heater. And one of the tasks that you would get to do is to run the long extension cord we didn't have a garage and run it out and plug the truck in and this thing would heat up the 
car, heat up the engine so that way he could start it in the morning. And, you know, can tell you, you know, 1967 vintage truck did not like the cold weather. Now, once it got warm, car truck was great, but it was a problem. So they're going to have to come up with some kind of heating system and conditioning system. And they're probably saying it's already there to a certain extent. But as we've seen in Chicago, that was a problem. Uh, and here's the other part. So that means any place like, you know, Wisconsin or Minnesota or Montana or you know Wyoming or someplace where it really gets seriously cold, I think we're gonna you're gonna run into this problem. Now, the crazy part about batteries is that batteries love the temperate zone. So as long as it doesn't get below a certain temperature or above a, temp a certain temperature, batteries are gonna do much better. Uh, I ran into this when I rented a Tesla and was in Arizona and the charging station said, because of adverse conditions, we're only going to charge the battery to 70%. And then that's it because it was so hot. And I mean, we're talking like 115 degrees of hot. So it were you know, those extremes and that's where technology has not evolved yet. And then we'll see what's going to happen. And what about Hertz selling Tesla's off? I guess I had the best experience with Hertz is that they were they were renting the cars cheap. In fact, cheaper than I could rent a gas car. So I ended up doing, and it would have to go back and check, but I'm going to say like five to seven times I rented a Tesla. By the way, Teslas are really expensive to rent now if you want to go rent one. And you know, I, I learned a lot by by doing that. When in fact we had a raging verbalist talking about that, you know. And now what happened is that Hertz found out a couple things. One is that Hertz does all of their own maintenance because of how big of a, a company they are. They don't farm it out. They don't do that. And that means they do all of it. Well, the downside of it is that Tesla doesn't sell parts easily. In fact, they don't even, they don't even make extra parts really. Not like you know, not like my Hondas that I have, because if you have a Honda or, you know, anything else, you can go down the dealership and say, this is the part I'm looking for. And they'll tell you if it's in the system or not. Um, and that that's in and of itself a big deal. So Hertz said, wow, we have higher maintenance costs because anytime a car can't be rented for whatever reason, then that's a lost day. And they mark it down as a revenue lost day. Makes sense. So they made the decision to unload like 20, 25 percent of the fleet. And they had done a big acquisition of Teslas. And frankly, I was impressed with the car. Some of the things I didn't like, but I was impressed with the car and the platform and all those things. Now, best experience I had, of course, is in Texas and we had an Airbnb and we charged it overnight and all of that. So that was an ideal case. But every other time you had to go out and look and look and look and got to get it charged because you don't want to bring it back with too little. So Hertz dumped a bunch of cars, which we'll talk about what the ramifications of that were, that is and what that means for going down the road. And what happened to the CEO? Well, the CEO got fired. The CEO, you know, ended up hitting the bricks because, well, this turned out to be a you know freaking disaster. And I feel for him because I think he was trying to do the the right thing. I think he was trying to figure out how to make this new leap into technology, make it available to his customers, you know, be out there and push this thing along. Uh, however, it turned out to be a, a money loser. And uh, well, that turns out to be a disaster. Now, that's not a surprise to me that things like that happen because of course of this. And that is, you got to go pick yourself up one of these, which is most businesses fail in the first five minutes. It just takes them three to five years to realize it, position to win. Didn't take them, well, it took them almost three years to realize it. By the way, you can get it physically at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever books are sold, you can go ask for this book and you can get it. You can also get it digitally on Kindle and Nook and iBooks. And then uh, then the reason why this makes sense in this place is that the decisions that they made, the things that they were trying to do and the challenges that they were running into is, you know, it's just the reality of, of adoption of new technology and how hard it is. And it was an experiment that failed and cost the CEO his job. Now, you know, I feel for anybody who has that, but of course, if they had read 
my book, maybe they would have avoided some of those things. Also, if you want to avoid other things, uh, go out and get Remote Work for a Better World, available exclusively on the Kindle store. And maybe you'll end up doing what we're doing here, which is using remote work in a more positive and better way, because I can tell you that most people do it very poorly. And then go to the website, positiontowinbook.com, positiontowinbook.com, and you can then have one of these autograph, or you can pick up a, an amazing Raging Verbalist mug as I zoom in carefully and show you that everything tastes just a little bit better, may get a little bit of a bite out of it, and who knows what might happen because of that. Now, back to it, Sandra. What do we have? Where do we go? All right. So why the change in the marketplace? Well, there's this thing called the adoption curve. And the adoption curve is one of these, you know, bell curves that happens whenever new technology comes in. Now, some, by the way, never make it through the adoption curve. It was a great idea that never went anywhere. However, EVs are getting pushed through the adoption curve. So the early, early adopters, those people who are really innovators and mavericks and those who are willing to put up with all the other stuff. Now, the downside of it is, of course, is that these people who have been out there, especially because I've watched a lot of YouTube videos about Teslas. And, and again, I like I like the you know my experiences and all of that. And, you know, and, you know, have to make a confession that, you know, I have some investment in Tesla, but I can tell you that that adoption curve takes time. And what's happening is that we're running into this problem right now because first off, uh, people are run, you know, they, they, they're not early adopters. Early adopters will put up with lots of pain in the ass stuff. If you're not an early adopter, you don't wanna put up with pain in the ass stuff. You want it to just work. You wanna be able to drive into the gas station, fill it up and boom, drive away. I drove my Mercedes E-Class from my brother's front door in Denver, Colorado, to my door here in California in 15 and three quarter hours. Now, that's because Utah has 80 mile an hour speed limits and all of that, but I can tell you that I was zooming through pit stops, you know, pulled into the shell in Grand Junction, filled that baby up, you know, changed the fluids. In fact, I wasn't even, I was trying not to drink anything and boom, away I went. Now. The point of it is, is that time is money. So you got this adoption curve and people don't want to essentially drive a car that every time you make a move, you're saying, okay, well, when am I gonna charge it? When am I not gonna charge it? And that is a problem. Also, what has happened is that the age, the average age of an automobile has gone up. Back in about 2009, 2010, it was 11 years. It's now gone up to 12.8 years. This means people are hanging on to cars longer and cars are lasting longer. That means that new technology will be slower to be adopted in spite of what regulators, bureaucrats, and pundits want to believe. That's the fact, Jack, unless somebody goes out and, and we've spent lots of money on incentives. And I can tell you that it is, you know, it's not pretty. Also, you, all you have to do oh, is- sorry. All, oh, hang on. I know you're excited. <laughs> so excited. So you wanna, excited. You jump in Charged there. up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So here's a Gallup <laughs> survey. Now, numbers are kind of crazy when you're doing these things, but Gallup has been tracking this. And in 23, the number of people who would say they would not buy a, an EV, would not buy it, was 41%. And unfortunately, it's gone the wrong direction because now the press can't always be positive, 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 positive. So now it's 48% in 2024. That is the wrong direction for the adoption curve. Next thing is they asked, would you might, you know, you might consider it. You might consider it. Well, that was at 43% in 23. Well, you know, that, that means it's percolating. People are thinking, maybe I'm going to get one. In 24, it dropped eight percentage points to 35%. Really a bad direction if you want to, if you're a believer in the EV fountain of youth. Now comes the real tough one. Seriously consider. Now, I seriously was considering buying a Tesla, but we'll get to that in a second. But seriously consider was a 12% right direction, it used to be like very, very low, but it's retreated back to 9%. Now, here's a piece of good news for all of you out there who saying, I'm just bashing. I'm just telling you what I observe and see. The currently owned has gone from 4% to 7%. So in that regard, we are moving forward in units. Okay, now, Sandra, you've got to say what you need to say. What do you got? <laughs> all right. So what do you think of the mandate 
states and states like California? Well, California does some kooky things, and and they 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 think that if you sign it as a rule or sign it as a regulation or sign it, that you will force people to do these things. Uh, so, for those who don't know, California has said by twenty thirty five, outright ban on internal combustion engines. You know what we're going to do is we're going to just have EVs from that point forward, and we're going to replace everything with EVs. Uh, I think that this is foolhardy. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to change opinion. They're trying to move things along. Uh, people are voting with their with their buckaroos. Uh, EVs are more expensive. By the way, all those people, and we're going to get to this in a second, all those people who said that, you know, EVs, when you look at the life cycle, were actually less expensive. Uh, balderdash is as strong a language as I will use today, but balderdash, that that was really going to happen. So I think that you know California is wrongheadedness, and I think that markets decide. And, and I'm an absolute libertarian on this. The market will decide if you let it, and will make the right choice, not regulators and government. And do you think other states will follow suit? Well, there's the there's what I call the knucklehead clan, and I say this derisively. So if you live in one of these places and you agree with what they're going to do, then, you know, just, you know, you, you won't be riding along, you'll be, you know, charging along, is that uh, Connecticut and Maryland and Massachusetts and New Jersey and New York and Oregon and Rhode Island and Washington have all said, we're going to follow California's lead and start banning uh, internal combustion engines or ICE cars. In, and it's funny that, that those are ICE cars, but they'll start in the cold, irony. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the universe always provides for these kinds of little sweet little nuggets. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a place like Massachusetts. I have been there in the wintertime when I was working at Mercury Computer Systems. And you can freeze your chinchillas off, I can tell you that, rolling along. So it's going to be interesting to see how that's going to work out, especially how many people don't have garages. I guess what we'll do is we'll just start building everybody a garage and a mechanism for doing this and that, that'll happen. But I think that other states will follow suit. I think it's wrongheaded. And I think the reason why it's wrongheaded is that trying to force things through a marketplace virtually never, ever, 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 ever works. And will you be buying an EV? Well, it's interesting that you asked that question because I was faced with that choice. And when Hertz was unloading these things, that Hertz was saying, hey, you know what, we're going to, we're going to, you know, do something with these things. We're going to, you know, sell them cheap, get them out the door. I started getting very interested in that. In fact, the, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, which is not an Inflation Reduction Act, but a, you know, green giveaway. They said, if you can get a car under 25,000 bucks, we're going to give you four grand. Now they've already given somebody 7,500 bucks beds. So I said, I'm going to go see about doing that. And I attempted to buy a Tesla off of the Hertz website. Never happened. Never happened for several reasons. First off, I would have a charging problem. So let's talk about charging. I have 40 solar panels on my roof, 40, 40. So I've got a really low carbon footprint, everybody. So I thought, man, I'm going to get me some free miles, right? I'm going to get me some free miles. So I, I had the guy who came out. And I needed something fixed on my solar system. He came out and did that. And I'm sitting there talking to him. And I said, do you install EV chargers? And he goes, absolutely. I said, okay, hey, tell me, give, give me a, you know, not a sign on the dotted line, but give me an estimate because I'm thinking about buying an EV, right? Because everybody tells me, not everybody, there's a large number of contingency, contingent people who say, hey, you know, this is going to be cheaper than driving a gas car. So he sits there and he measures from my box to where I need the charger. See, because the car isn't close to the electricity because none of this stuff was designed for this, right? So he says, well, John, I got some bad news for you. The copper wire to, to move a real charger to you is 3,400 bucks. He goes, that's my cost. I went, yikes. And total all in after we put in all of the labor and buying the charger and everything, roughly it's going to be about seven thousand dollars now i get it i i need to you know eat better and floss and stay in better shape the curves don't cross at that point in time now if they wanted to give me a charger and well 
But John, they, they'll, there are those out there who say, but John, they would have given you 1500 bucks. Okay, take 5500 bucks and divide it out. How long do I have to, one, live here, and two, how, how is that incremental savings going to happen? It is a terrible investment. One of the biggest problems that, that they're going to run into, they being the pushers of this technology, is that houses are not built, designed, or set up to charge EVs. They're not building houses today to, to do that. Maybe a little bit. My neighbor across the street bought a Tesla. And it turns out that he has to use a trickle charge that's called a 110 volt outlet because, well, his house doesn't have enough electricity to put in a 40 amp circuit to get that level two faster charging. So yeah, that, that became a detriment. I couldn't, I couldn't actually get the Hertz site to work where I could actually buy one. I tried. Figure why not get it, get it super deal. But here was the real rub of it. Having owned a finance company, and that, you know, if you want to hear how that turned out, go, you know, uh, you know, you got to go look at the Valley of Fire story. But I learned doing that, that the biggest cost of owning a car is depreciation. That is the biggest cost of owning a car. When Elon Musk made the unthinkable decision of reducing his sale price by several thousand dollars, in some cases, $4,250, when her started unloading 40 something thousand dollar cars for $25,000, that resets the market. That depreciation is gone. All of those people who were counting on having some kind of residual value. And when you go online and you say, what is the depreciation curve of a Tesla? I could not find in research of this raging verbalist, a single site that honestly told me and factored in this new kick in the, well, you figure out where you wanna be kicked hardest because they just lost tens of thousands of dollars because no one is going to give them anywhere near what they paid or sadly what they're owed. That is a serious problem. And so that put the final kibosh on me ever going or ever of doing it right now, I'll pick up cheap cars wherever I can find them. But right now, it just didn't work. Now, if you got great value on this, I'm happy. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe. If you want to be annoyed from YouTube, hit the notification thing. Or check us out on Position to Win book, Facebook group. And for myself, John Paul Mendoza, Dr. Speed Selling, and the ever-lovely Sandra, this has been Raging Verbalist number 224. Have a great one. And we'll see you next week in another charged up episode.